It's, but it's hypothesis testing of two sample hypothesis testing. Two sample, as opposed to one sample. This was only if you took one sample, five numbers, got one average, one standard deviation, one of everything. Now in this chapter, we're going to get two of everything. And the best way to begin is by doing an example. Um, in a case here, let's say, for example, somebody says, I believe the average male smoker who smokes, smokes four and a half packs a week. Four and a half packs a week. And someone says, no, that's wrong. I think it's not four and a half packs. So they have a whole debate, and they do collect some data. They go to 25 smokers, and they say, how many packs you smoke a week? Or three packs, six packs, five packs. And they get the average, and they make the whole thing to decide to accept or reject. By, by the way, Brian, we're on. OK. So now, but what if somebody doesn't care about the actual number, but cares about a relative statement comparing two groups of people, or two groups of whatever. It doesn't have to be people. For example, somebody says, I believe the average male smoker smokes the same as the average female smoker. So now we have two populations. And we're going to have to take two samples. So it's called a two-sample hypothesis testing. The H1 is going to be, well, the simplest case is they're simply saying that males and females are not the same. But of course, you'll see in some more advanced examples, trying to prove that males smoke more than females. That'll be a greater than sign, in which case you've got to make this a less than sign. We'll get into those more advanced examples as we go through the chapter. But right now, we'll take the simple case. Now, what does one and two stand for? Well, one and two, in this case, stands for males and females. And it's good to write down, because every example is one and two, one and two, because you keep two, two groups. By the way, in chapter 11, which you're not going to see until you take stat two, then we have three groups, males, I'm sorry, blacks, whites, and Asian people. Now we have two groups, blacks versus whites, or males versus females, or older versus younger, or lefties versus righties, any two groups of people. Or it doesn't, okay, it doesn't have to be people. It could be the day shift versus the night shift in terms of how the machinery is working. So, so we, th this is, that's the question we're trying to solve. So it's clearly a hypothesis testing. It's clearly too sample. And also I could point out, I don't have it on the board right now, but hopefully you, for those of you who are here have it in your notes, and I believe it's on videotape. I made that extensive outline for all the material that might be on that final, because it's you know, hi probability and hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. And this is sort of the end of that whole outline. And this is step number one. So step number one is finished. Now already, now by the what's the, what's harder about step number one compared to step number one before? Well, there's two of these things. That's harder. What's easier about it? Can somebody tell me quickly? Because we only have five minutes, six minutes. What's easier about this compared to what we did in chapter nine? Now we're doing chapter ten. Yes, David. There's no number. You don't have to worry about it. It's a four point five or two point eight. There's no number here. It's a relative statement. Okay, and if sometimes the book asks you to talk about the difference between them, thank you. Press it back, please. The difference between them. Um, so the difference mu one minus mu two is how much? How much of a difference between them are we hypothesizing? No difference, because they're basically the same. So the book might say you know, when you do it online, mu one minus mu two equals zero. That's a separate issue. Okay, so what's going to be the next step? Well, again, I haven't trained you. We only, only did this for a while, but what's the second step always in hypothesis testing? Chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. The answer is you do some kind of calculation. It happens to be also a T calculation. There's, there's a Z version, which you're not going to be responsible for. There's a whole bunch of other versions which you're not responsible for. But the, the, now, what's the formula? Well, this time the formula made sense. You take the average, you compare it to the ideal number, we take into account the standard error. We, we, we talked about the logic of that formula. Now what's the formula? If you didn't, again, for those of you who might have looked at the book, please don't answer. For those of you who are seeing this for the very first time and you have some intuition about what we think the formula is going to look like, and somebody thought, now it's going to be a complicated formula, but the first part of it should be pretty commonsensical. What's the beginning of that formula, do you think? Well, do you think you're going to have to take the average of each group? In order to, you think, it'll be, you think the x-bar 1 and the x-bar 2, which is the average of this group and the average of this group, do you think that's going to be a relevant part of the calculation? Obviously. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to divide them, multiply them, square them? What? Subtract them. You want to see how far apart they are. OK, because if they're close, if the 8, 0 is true, these two have, what would be the t value? Close to 0. You should put a 0 here. That's the easy part. That's the commonsensical part of the formula. But then the bottom part of the formula, instead of having only one s and one n, now we have two s's and two n's, so it gets complicated. Again, I'll it's called a pooled version. 
the pooled version of the formula, there are different versions, we, and this is the main one that we're talking about. And the formula goes like this, n1 minus 1 times s1 squared. Now, the, the truth is the bottom part of the formula always had s's in them, but now we have squares for mathematical reasons, but we square root it so we end up with the same thing. n2 minus 1 times the variance of the second group. And by the way, we're assuming that the s1 squared is similar to the s2 squared, and it will, or better, well, I'll explain that in more detail. Divided by like an average of the two groups, and furthermore, it's multiplied underneath the radical sign, one over n1 plus one over n2. This comes out to, Now, this looks like a complicated formula, and it is a complicated formula. The only good news is that you're allowed to write down the formula for the test while you're doing this on, on home, and you're allowed to use a calculator, even allowed to use pH tests. You can just type numbers in. I, I, when, I give, when I give the test in class, and everybody has the same numbers, the same formula, the same calculator, I get about 20 different answers. Like, hardly anybody gets the same to get it right. I don't know. It's just a matter of doing it the right numbers. Anyway, this is a, a challenge, but not too much of a challenge. <laughs> Now, so we're gonna we'll talk about maybe I'll let you do, we'll do one in class if we have time. If not, we'll just we'll just do it for homework. But after you've plugged all your numbers, so you have to be given two averages, two standard deviations, which you're gonna square, two sample size, and one refers to the sample size of the first group. Let's say 25 men were chosen, and N2 might be the sample size of the other, maybe 35 women were chosen, whatever. Okay. What's step number three gonna be? Well, we don't have time to play 20 questions, so I'm gonna give the answer myself. Always step number three is making some kind of a diagram. What diagram? Clearly it'll be the T diagram. Just like, okay, no, we, don't make, we don't make a line here. Remember, it's bigger than one. And you make the reject H0 region if, it's, if, the, if these two numbers are far apart from each other, that proves that the H1 is right. If, the, if they're one is much lower than the other, it also proves the H0 is right, the H1 is right. But if the two of them are similar, if the difference is close to zero, that means we accept the A0, do not reject A0. What has to be told to you in order to finish up the example? The alpha, now you're gonna chop the alpha in half? What? Why, why do we chop it in half? Because there are two of them. The reason we chopped them in half last chapter is because there are two of them, likewise there are two of them. Okay, now what about degrees of freedom? It can't be n minus one anymore because there's no n. There's n one, there's n two. So if you take the degree of freedom of one group and the degree of freedom of the other group and you add them together, the, the degrees of freedom simply add together, you're gonna get n one plus n two minus two. So the degree of freedom is n two minus two. And finally, when you get your calculation, which again, easier said than done, you're gonna make an arrow, just like in chapter nine, and decide to accept or reject. If you accept, that means you're proving the two groups are the same. If you reject, it proves the two groups are different. You accept or reject. So that's basically an outline of the whole chapter. Now the online version of the formula of the, of the, of the homework asks you to also calculate a confidence interval, which I'll talk about in class next time. I guess I have to because it's, it's a large part of the homework. Um, but if you see that and you want to either teach it to yourself fine. If you want to skip it, it's also fine. But I want you to practice those three or four homeworks in chapter 10, which is already assigned on, on, the, on the online, that ask you to basically take two sets of data and, and get the result. Now, there are two types of problems, of course. One type, they give you the average, they give you the standard deviation on a silver platter. Other types, they just give you the data. They say group one has these numbers and group two has these numbers. And you have to, of course, take the time to calculate the average of this group the average of that group, the standard deviation of this group, the standard, I mean, of course, it's much more tedious, but there's not too many numbers. But again, if you're really smart, you take those numbers and you paste them into Excel, and Excel can calculate the average for you, and Excel can calculate the standard deviation for you. So you don't really have to worry about that kind of uh, tedious stuff.